important rules, I think, for business. So I've asked James Ritchie from Mindful Risk to talk to you about managing downside and making sure you're not making decisions through this period of chaos and uncertainty that are going to bite you on the ass on the other end. His background is in high-end complex risk management for large-scale organization and industry, from mining to healthcare to indigenous affairs to not-for-profits. And he's going to go through a series of bow tie methodologies and checklists to be able to help you make sure you're bomb-proof through this time. There's something about knowing that you're doing the right things in the right way to protect your downside while allowing for upside that helps with that sleep at night factor. So before I pass you over to James Ritchie, a little bit of context. So you're about to sit in on a session from one of our crisis reinvention team, but let me give you some quick context. When COVID started to seriously impact businesses, we mobilized experts from within the Dent community to be able to help business leaders like yourself navigate the difficult decisions across a variety of topics, including how to access finance and grants, to cash management, to human resource law, to marketing and sales strategies, to cool tools and tech that you can use from home, through to high stakes leadership, health, wellness, stress management, not just for yourself, but for your team and look a whole lot more. For the full schedule with more being added every week, visit dent.global forward slash reinvent and we hope you find it a useful resource. All right, let's do this. Hey guys, James Ritchie here from Mindful Risk. Really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this crisis reinvention team and wanna do a big shout out to Glenn and the Dent team I think it's a great initiative that you're doing, guys, and um, flattered and privileged to be a part of it. Similarly, any of you guys and girls out there watching this that haven't been exposed to the KPI program or the Dent product suite before, I strongly encourage you to go and get yourself involved at the very minimum with the KPI book. And I would also suggest the scorecard and any of the other resources that the Dent team provide, particularly the podcast. That's one of my favorite ones. So thank you guys. Look, so what we're here to talk about today is the current crisis, pandemic, whatever you want to call it. It's got a whole bunch of different names. I think, yeah, I prefer to steer clear from most of them because they just make me feel a bit depressed and anxious. And no doubt plenty of you guys and girls out there in the real world are experiencing the whole spectrum of emotions of positive and negative all sort of mashed up together and it can be a very overwhelming experience. So my business and what I'm going to talk to you about today is a business called Mindful Risk. So who are we? What do we do? So we help businesses, particularly in high, highly regulated sectors like resources, like healthcare, aged care, not-for-profit, disability and rail and all those sort of other ones in between, um, implement better and improved internal risk management processes and systems. So historically, our business and the types of clients and our niche that we work with is usually businesses that are big enough or complex enough to number one, need a board of directors or are required to have a board of directors, or secondly, are in a, a sector that's got a significant regulatory burden over and above what other businesses have. So businesses such as insolvency practitioners, businesses such as mining and extractives, businesses such as aged care, healthcare, they've all got significant regulatory burdens and they've certainly got requirements placed on them by their regulator in relation to risk management. So usually working with entrepreneurs isn't the, I guess, target market and certainly isn't the niche that we work with. However, when I saw this opportunity come up, I thought, look, there is some great takeaways in terms of what the corporate world, for want of a better term, is doing in relation to risk management that we could certainly apply to our current situation with the KPI community. So that's really the aim of what I'm going to try and get, get you through today. Try and get not so much the, the bureaucracy and the complexity that often comes with some of the work and some of the requirements that bigger, more complex businesses have in relation to risk management. More about trying to get you guys to understand the key takeaways or, the, or let's call it the foundational concepts that really are thinking concepts, they really are decision-making concepts around risk management. So hopefully I'll get that across to you today. Aiming to go for about 30 minutes or less, um, and certainly 
look, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback on all of this and always, as it is with all of these types of things, share it widely and freely and um, let's get into it. Okay, concise risk management frameworks for business continuity and recovery. Sounds like a bit of a mouthful, doesn't it? And I think we all know that most of us, particularly in small business or entrepreneur land, I would even say in big business land, as soon as people say the words risk management, you can virtually straight away see everyone's eyes glaze over. And it is literally, I would say, one of everybody's least favorite topics. However, there's some great aspects of it that are really, really relevant now in this COVID-19 period. But for me and for us, I think they're foundational and I think they can be some great value add concepts for you guys to get your heads around both currently in the COVID-19 world, but then also to set you up with a far better framework and a foundation for a stronger, more resilient, and certainly ultimately more risk-proof business in the future. Because at the end of the day, look, I will say from the get-go in my perspective, COVID-19 isn't the last of these significant pandemic events that human history's seen. It's probably the most significant one that most of us in the Western world have seen in our lifetimes, but it will not be the last. And if it's not the COVID-19 pandemic, it'll be something to do with IT or cybersecurity. There will be significant global events that we will have to deal with in our business, I would say for the foreseeable future. Um, and the quicker we can just get our approaches and our systems to match that environment, the better it's going to be and the more confidence and the less anxiety that it can build for us as business owners. And I'll, I'll emphasize that a lot throughout the presentation today. Really good risk management is predominantly, look, everybody thinks it's all negative and about threat reduction, th you know, exposure reduction. That's a component of it. But we're going to talk also about opportunity identification. So in terms of the, the feeling aspect for me and certainly being a director in not-for-profit entities and certainly anyone out there I'm speaking to that's a director themselves, either on the board of a, you know, a private listed not-for-profit entity. This is about making you feel more confident about the uh, ability of your business to achieve its objectives. And then it's also about you feeling less exposed, about keeping your ass covered for want of a better term. You want your ass covered, you don't want it hanging in the breeze, but at the same time, you wanna feel confident. And so these processes, they are about the negative side, but as we'll see as we go on, it's also about the positive opportunity identification side. So let's just start right back at the basics with this risk and risk management term. What the hell is it? It gets thrown around all the time these days. It's risk, risk, blah, 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 blah. If anyone that works in APRA or, you know, let's call it anyone that's exposed to entities that have been part of the Banking Royal Commission, it's just the token buzzword of, you know, let's call it, 2018 onwards but let's actually have a look at what it means and then hopefully you'll start to see what it can what it can mean for you and your business in terms of decision making so risk let's start right back at the basics risk by definition and this is the definition out of what we call iso 31000 a lot of you probably already know what it is but it's the international standard for risk management i'm not going to go any further into that because if i haven't lost everybody at that point once I start going into the, into the international standard space, I can guarantee I'll lose you. Right, so the definition of risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So hopefully, I apologize for my khaki-handed angular writing there, but I'm trying to minimize my ability to smudge that whiteboard. Okay, the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Sounds pretty basic and simple, doesn't it? It's actually not, and there's actually a lot more in it than what you would anticipate. So let's just pull out the core concepts there. So the first one, objectives. It's an interesting one, isn't it? So if anybody thinks about what an objective is in a business sense, you know, you think about smart, objectives, you think about measurable, quantifiable, real, meaty objectives. That's really what this first concept's about. So risk only exists in relation to business objectives or objectives in general. So that's the first concept, concept number one. Risk only relates and only exists in relation to objectives. As a result of that, do you think it's a fair call or a fair statement to make 
that if you don't clearly understand your business objectives, you can't effectively manage the risk to those objectives. Given that this isn't a live webinar, I'm just gonna nod my head and go, I'm thinking the answer is yes. So that is the first concept there. That's number one, objectives. The second, effect. And you'll notice all the grammar Nazis out there, it's effect with an E, not effect with an A. So effect with an E is in most cases what it is, it's a noun. Whereas effect with an A is most often used as a verb. So effect with an E being the noun, it means the impact as a result of, right? So what we're really saying here is risk is only in relation to objectives and it's the impact as a result of what? It's an impact as a result of uncertainty. And so that's the third concept, the third of three concepts there. So number one, objectives. Risks, risk only exists in relation to business objectives and it can only be understood once you understand your objectives. Number two, effect with an E. So it is the impact or change or result of. Number three, uncertainty. So again, what the hell's uncertainty? Uncertainty's got two concepts that are really important to understand. So if you're not an economics or a risk management nerd like me, and I know that there's plenty out there that are, and you're probably already way ahead of me on this, uncertainty's got two aspects of it. What I call foreseeable, and what most people call foreseeable, again, sorry my, for my scribble, and what I would say inherent. Okay, so in relation to our business objectives, uh, we've got uncertainty, the effect of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is driven by both foreseeable and inherent uncertainty. So what the hell do we do with that even? We go, oh, okay, yeah, that's great, I know that now, but so what? Well, what it really means is that if you fail to understand these two aspects of uncertainty and their effect on your business objectives, you're failing to manage risk. And so what I wanna build on as the last, I've probably you know, lost you all, you're probably all snoozing now at this point in the video, but that's fine if you're still with me crack on. The inherent uncertainty, I think it's really, really interesting to understand that, particularly at the moment in related to COVID. So look, I think we all know at a strategic level, if we're smart and we run businesses that are globally linked, global pandemics are certainly there sort of hovering in the back of your mind in terms of strategic risks that might impact your business. Think about SARS, think about swine flu, think about the Hendra virus even. So it's probably in the back of our consciousness there somewhere but we probably in the most part didn't really give it too much weight. That's probably a great example of this, let's call it inherent uncertainty. And I would say the big bit about these two concepts is let's say uh, um, uncontrollable to a large extent, so tr controllable and controllable. So I'm sure everyone's heard a lot in the last couple of weeks about I guess, you know, focusing on the things that we can control versus the things that we can't control. I would encourage you to think about this inherent uncertainty in those terms. So it's uncontrollable. It's those kind of out there in the sort of universe type issues that we probably never expect to happen, but we need to be aware that they are the, let's call it the unknown unknowns. We know that they're unknown, but we don't really know much about them other than that. So that's the inherent side. So what I'm saying is, you need to understand that there are unknown unknowns. Tick, that's that one done. This one on the other hand, foreseeable uncertainty. If you're running a business and if you're trying to run a business that's performance oriented, you really need to be on top of this foreseeable uncertainty. So many in the, I guess in the, in the wash up of this whole COVID-19 um, process or period will probably start playing into this space, you know, think about books like um, The Black Swan, or sorry, Black Swan, in terms of, um, let's call it events that in hindsight were viewed to be foreseeable, but at the time everybody was effectively snow blind. I'm not gonna pass judgment on where this is all gonna land at the moment, but I think in the future, people might be trying to land COVID in that space, and they might be right. I might be trying to land COVID in that space. But what I'm trying to say to you is that there is uncertainty related to your business objectives and the effect of it that you can control and you can identify it and you can manage it, you can control it. So really in essence, what we're trying to bring that all back to now is that 
risk is far more than just that, oh yeah, we've got to make sure we have insurance and have some like safety policies in place and all that sort of stuff. It's actually a pretty big picture macroeconomic concept that really ultimately relates back to your ability to make decisions as a, as a business or your ability to make optimized quality decisions. So I won't labor that too much more other than to say that we now understand that risk has three key components. Number one, it only can be understood and managed when it's related to your objectives. And in order to do that, you need to understand what your objectives are as a business. And then secondly, you need to understand the effect of inherent uncertainty and I would say analyze and, and put systems in place to address the foreseeable uncertainty and the effect of that on your objectives. That's the closest you're gonna get in this current environment to trying to, I guess, get back on top of things and get yourself a plan for, for going forward in this period after COVID-19. Okay, all right, now that we understand risk as a concept, and hopefully you now understand it at a, at a greater level or at a, a deeper level than what you previously would have or appreciated. Really, what I want you to take away from that discussion is that risk is really about the unanticipated consequences of our decisions that either negatively or positively impact our ability to achieve our business objectives. So if you understand that's the fundamental basis of risk, that it's everywhere, it's got an inherent and a foreseeable concept uh, context to it, but ultimately it's about the unknown or the uncertain. So risk management by definition is, look, obviously and predictably, it's the activities, measures, processes, systems and decisions that we make in a business context to mitigate, transfer, modify or otherwise um, manage the risks that impact our ability to achieve our business objectives. I'd like to put a more positive spin on that in terms of saying, well, if we understand that risk is the concept that I've just explained to you now, I would prefer that you view risk management really as the processes you put in place to maximize your chance of achieving your business objectives and minimizing the chance that you'll have adverse outcomes befall you while you're um, in the process of trying to achieve your business objectives. So risk management's a positive thing. And as we'll see, as we go along here, for you guys as um, entrepreneurs and smaller business owners, I can't emphasize enough that risk management is viewed as this sort of arbitrary bureaucratic process that lives in you know, the banking world or in the world of boards of directors. I don't think it is at all. I think it's a fundamental decision-making process. And ultimately for me and for our business, it's an actual, I believe it's an actual language of uncertainty. And so once you can learn to speak that language, I believe that you can actually learn as an organization and as an individual to make better quality, better informed business decisions. That's really what I'm, I'm trying to get across on all of this. And obviously these are about thinking concepts. That's why I've tried to go quite deep into some of them because for you guys, a lot of businesses that are hopefully seeing this video, you're not gonna be big enough that you've got a board of directors and 5,000 employees and you operate a, you know, a power station or a, um, uh, a, a set of you know chemical processing plants or something like that. That's probably not the audience in the KPI program, but I'm trying to get hopefully the, the benefits of what those types of sectors do at a thought process level across to you guys. So hopefully it can benefit you. So that's risk management. Okay, so now that we've got the basics of what I would like to get across to you guys in terms of how you can change your mindset or how you can really reframe risk and risk management as a language of business decision-making and uncertainty. Now I'm gonna get into some of the tools. And again, these are the, the processes and systems and concepts that are often used by the big, big end of town for want of a better term. And I'm gonna give you a basic background on them. By no means, it's not a, designed to be a, a deep technical dive because you don't need that or want it. And if you're really excited about it, you can go and read the relevant international standards and Australian standards and all that sort of stuff. What I wanna again focus on is giving you the key takeaways that would be in my mind most relevant to the KPI community and to your businesses in general. So business continuity, again, it's probably a term that you've probably heard a lot in the last couple of weeks or the last month. If you're not already familiar with it, it's really just about, again, an extension of this ultimate risk management process where you have effectively analyzed your business and analyze the types of things that might cause significant 
outages and interruptions to your business and ultimately prevent it from achieving its objectives. And then you've taken appropriate steps to put risk controls in place to systematically prevent that from happening. The PPRR cycle, what the hell is that? Uh, look, stands for prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. We've just talked about business continuity. It's the risk management cycle that businesses can apply to business continuity and emergency management. So look, anyone that's worked in the Defence Force or in frontline emergency services or marine services would probably be already familiar with this. But so we've got this cycle and it works as what they call a Deming cycle. So anyone that's worked around standards or quality management systems like the ISO 9001 standard would be familiar with Deming cycles. It's really just stands for, it's just a continuous improvement loop. So this process is designed to be iterative and designed to be repeated. Okay, so prevention, preparedness, I'm probably gonna spell this wrong as well, preparedness, response, and recovery. So again, bigger businesses, businesses in highly regulated sectors, they've got this shit on lock, pardon the French, or well, certainly the good ones do. What it means is that they've got systems and processes and arguably you know, too much at times, but the good ones have really quality um, mindsets and frameworks to be constantly looking at what are the four areas around their business continuity that, ne that they need to be constantly analyzing and preventing, preparing for, responding to, or recovering from. So look, predictably at the moment, I think the whole world, but certainly the whole business world, is living in this space here, in the response space. So this is, if you look around at other businesses, these are all these pandemic control plans and other things that people are firing out everywhere and guidelines and splitting teams into A teams and B teams and isolating workforces. That's really, that's tactical. That's what I would call tactical or response planning there. But at a point in the not too distant future, I hope, we'll move into this stage here, which is the recovery phase. So this is where the business has, let's call it weathered the storm through COVID-19 and you're getting ready to bring your staff back into um, offices. You're getting ready to interact directly with clients again. And so what I'm gonna hopefully get your heads across um, at the end of all of this is you'll see that really the recovery phase then leads back to the prevention and preparedness phase. So there's a fantastic opportunity if you get your head around this thought process and around these concepts that once this crisis starts to subside and you start to recover, you're, you can use systems and use this thinking to help your business move back into a stage where it actually comes back up with a far stronger foundation to actually prevent and prepare for future, uh, let's call it global crises for want of a better term. So whether it's, as I said at the start, whether it's another COVID type pandemic, whether it's some sort of cyber related event, who knows what it's going to be. That's probably all I wanted to cover off with the business continuity PPRR cycle. And again, the concept that I'm looking to get you to take away from this as entrepreneurs and smaller business owners is the thinking process. So I'm a very critical and analytical thinker. And I think you'll find probably any of us out there that run accountancy businesses or law firms, you have that, tend, it tends to be a particular personality type that lives in this space that has this kind of mindset. What I'd encourage the rest of the KPI community and the rest of the entrepreneur community out there, don't, don't pull the handbrake to happiness on too hard and think that I'm trying to tell you that you need to be like a bureaucratic big business. All I'm trying to get across to you is the thought process involved in this, that you've got a systematic, continuously improvement-based thought process in your mind and you're applying that to your business systems. So that's the PPRR cycle. Okay, so we've now built, hopefully in a steady crescendo, these concepts. So we understand risk, we understand risk management. We've now moved over to business continuity and we've looked at the PPRR cycle. And again, key takeaways, it's about the thought process, it's about using systematic evidence, consistent iterative, sorry, iterative processes within your business and within the way your brain works to make sure that you're making informed quality decisions. So 
we build on all of that and we go, okay, well, let's start to move into the real deal. How do we actually get this business continuity stuff happening? So one of the pivotal ways you do that is what we call a business impacts assessment. It's got a few different names. Analysis, assessment, it's really sort of potato, potato. So B, I, A, business impact assessment. Sounds kind of scary, it actually doesn't have to be. So anyone that's done basic, and I'm sure if you could put your hands up, everybody would be saying it. Anybody that's done a basic SWOT analysis before, probably arguably a number of those amazing tools that we work with in the KPI program are probably fundamentally based on strength, weakness, opportunity and threat analysis. Really, in simple terms, if that's all you have the capability to do within your business, that's all you need to do to conduct a business impact assessment or analysis. So what you need to quantify though, to really do it properly, is understand right back at the basics there, what your business objectives are. And so they might they they really need to be measurable and quantified business objectives. So whether it's, you know, 25% um, gross revenue growth in the next three years. That's about probably the level you want to get into. You don't need to get too granular, but then you need to look at conducting this business impact assessment to start to really understand what are the types of things that can impact your business in an adverse manner. We'll talk about the opportunity side of risk, as I said, coming up, but this is purely on the negative side. What are the types of things that could impact your business and its ability to achieve its objectives? And then the very, very Critical thing, which we will move into very shortly, is about the time or the time weighted value of those impacts. So a business impact assessment, again, don't be scared by it. Don't think it's, oh, it's just all this sort of, you know, um, what do you call it, corporate sector claptrap. Yes, it is, but it doesn't have to be. It's just about looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in your business, but taking a particular focus on the impacts of your business Oh, sorry, the impacts on your business of those particular threats in a time-weighted value. So time-weighted value. And I'll explain what that means momentarily, value. God, my writing is terrible, I apologize. Okay, so we've talked now about this business impact assessment. And again, it doesn't have to be a big, weighty, ridiculous, complex sort of thing. It could be a, a very quick, as I said, SWOT analysis and you might look at the technology aspects as a strength you might look at the infrastructure aspects of your business as a weakness you might look at the threats being um, what do you call it COVID-19 related supply chain interruptions. It can be a very basic, very open, kind of like a brainstorming session for you and your team. But so what I'm getting to is you've got to identify in a systematic way the types of threats that are going to impact your business and what are the time-based variants that are the most critical for your business to be able to continue to meet its objectives. So I will, oops, I'll rub that off and I'll explain what I mean because again, it just being a risk management nerd, I just tend to get bogged down in all this sort of techno babble mumbo jumbo and I need to bring it back to, to planet Earth. So when I was saying time-based, what we need to establish is, and again, I'm, it is death by acronym, but this space is death by acronym, unfortunately anyway, maximum, it's got a few different variations, maximum allowable, whoops, outage. So M, it's, some people call it MOA, some people call it MAO, it doesn't really, maximum outage allowable, let's say that. So what it means is that for those threat events that you identify, let's say it's inability, let's say one of the business impacts of COVID-19, to use an example, is the inability of your business to be able to effectively deliver its core service because COVID-19 is interrupting your IT infrastructure. So the servers, say for example, I know a lot of smaller businesses currently in this crisis have really struggled with accessing IT infrastructure externally. So they might have a server 
somewhere else and all of their staff are off site trying to access um, the company's servers back at the office, either physically or remotely located. So what you need to establish is based on that impact on the business, what is the maximum amount of time that your business could continue to operate with that impact in place before it seriously and significantly adversely affects your business. So usually it's in sort of broad scale time terms that we want to establish this stuff. So if you take that example, roughly speaking, it might be that unless you take specific and direct action, and this is where the, the risk management thing and the risk controls will start to come in shortly. If you take, if you fail to take direct action on say that example, it might mean that within 72 hours, if you leave that issue unaddressed, that your business will be no longer able to deliver its core objectives. So no longer able to deliver on its core service offerings that are, are critical to that business. That's the way you work out that 72 hours. And so we use those SWOT analysis tools or you use those brainstorming tools. That is one way, one of many ways to establish this maximum allowable outage. What I'm going to go on to now is kind of my little signature tool. So I certainly didn't create it, but it's certainly a very well used and well recognized um, risk management and risk analysis tool now. It's called the bow tie analysis. Um, it's certainly got a very significant and technical background. I'm not going to go into that at all with you guys. I want to give you just a quick and dirty, let's call it a tactical bow tie lesson, tactical ties. So let's move on to that and hopefully um, you'll start to see all the pieces of this puzzle start to link together. Okay, so building, building, building in this risk analysis, risk management space. So we've talked about business continuity planning, we've talked about business impact assessment. I've covered very briefly this concept of the maximum allowable outage. Again, takeaways for you guys in the entrepreneur community out there, it's about having a systematic and considered way of thinking about the business, its objectives, the risks that they that you face in relation to those objectives. Business continuity planning, one of the best ways, and certainly one of the best ways of establishing good business continuity risk management in these times, and I would argue in any time, is using a tool called the bow tie analysis. It can be, or it certainly is often used in quite a complex fashion in sectors such as chemical processing, offshore petroleum and gas, um, the extractives industry. It's certainly though also becoming really commonplace in the financial services sector and other sectors well outside of where it traditionally came from. Um, and yeah, sorry, bad dad joke. I'm, I love a good dad joke, so hence the bow tie. So what value is the bow tie to you guys as small business owners or members of the KPI community? For me, I think that it's a great narrative pictorial way of trying to unpack risks, controls, unwanted events, and um, I guess methods that you can put in place quite quickly and efficiently to make sure that you've adequately and effectively managed the risks that are foreseeable to your business. So if you remember back to the original discussion, you wanna make sure you clearly understand your objectives, you've adequately at least recognized the unknown unknown, the inherent uncertainty, but you've then also certainly addressed the foreseeable risk, so the controllable uncertainty associated with your business. So I'll go into what a bow tie is shortly, but technique wise, what I really, really love about bow ties, and this is what I call our three C's, are that bow ties more than almost any other risk analysis tool out there, or risk management tool out there, allow you to really focus on these three things, the three C's. So controls, as in risk controls, Connection, as in connection and interdependencies between bits of your business, between yeah other bits, uh, aspects of your supply chain, all sorts of things. And causality. What I mean by causality is it allows you to show a narrative pictorial style pathway that is clearly and easily understood by a wide audience. So if you imagine these things, they're kind of almost just like a structured mind map. That's probably a a good way to think of it. Everybody knows mind maps. This is just like a slightly structured, more boundaried mind map. They certainly can go into very technical spaces, but they don't need to. So let's get cracking and I'll show you on the board what an actual bow tie looks like and we'll, we'll do some worked examples. So it hopefully gives you some benefit that you can apply to your own business. So 
classic bow tie, and this is sort of almost like the cliche 20 year old example on a bow tie. You've got to start with the unwanted event. So everybody's just thinking um, COVID-19 at the moment, and they're thinking oh, impact of COVID-19, all that sort of stuff. I want to encourage you to think a little bit more deep, a little bit more deeply and more critically about the specific aspects of COVID-19 that may directly impact your business and its ability to meet their objectives. So I'll start with a general example, then we'll get more specific. So the general example is, this is how you start a bow tie. You've got to identify what we call the, let's call it the significant unwanted event. The classic one that everybody uses, it's a real world, real life example is let's say kitchen fire. Okay, so that's the middle. What could happen as a result of a kitchen fire? We could start a house fire. Probably we could end up with a burn, significant or insignificant. Probably could end up with person being killed, person losing life. That's probably just three possible outcomes. So a kitchen fire occurs, someone could lose their life, someone could get a significant burn, someone could end up um, setting fire to the, the house in general. I mean, they're sort of related, but this is just for illustrative purposes. And then you go, all right, well, what could cause a kitchen fire? Well, we go over to this side then and we go, what do we think could cause a kitchen fire? Um, unattended stove. What else could cause a kitchen fire? Could it be an electrical fault? Uh, what else? Is there other, God, I'm just thinking out loud here. Electrical fault could be um, improper use. Stove, you know, little Johnny decides to try and um, melt a couple of GI Joes or something like that. Your son or daughter decides they want to throw some um, playing cards into a into a pot on the stove or a, something like that, just to see what see what happens. So you can see in the middle there's the kitchen fire, and you can see the outcome is somebody losing their life, somebody getting a significant burn, or setting the house on fire. That could be caused by somebody leaving something unattended on the stove, somebody uh, an electrical fault in the system, or somebody improperly using the stove. That's just, again, illustrative purposes. So you can see this mind map process developing. And you go, all right, well, the beauty of these bad boys is that you go, all right, well, now what we can do is we can see a really, a really easy causal pathway to then go, all right, we wanna stop that kitchen fire occurring. So what can we put in place to stop that occurring? So an, un an unattended stove, I'm thinking you could put in like an auto shut off switch or something like that. Switch or a timer. An electrical fault, you could make sure that you've got RCDs, so you know, safety switches, oops, RCDs. Improper use of the stove. Look, I don't know, you could say, you know, only mum and dad use the stove or something like that. So we can see that theoretically, if those three, let's call them risk controls, are in place, they should stop the kitchen fire. I think we probably agree with that. So if the kitchen fire still occurs, so if these risk controls fail, what would prevent these events still happening? So over on this side here, we can talk about, so these are what we call our preventative controls. And over on this side, we call them mitigating. Again, full of wank words today, that's my business and that's how I love to talk, but mitigating controls really are just controls that stop it from being really bad in a, in a practical sense. So what are the mitigating controls that you could put in place to stop a house fire? So you could have um, fire blankets. You could have fire extinguishers. No, you could have, um, what do you call it? 
shower, you know, sprinkler systems. I mean, you're not going to have those in a residential house, but you know what I mean, sprinkler systems. So what we can see is that we understand that those controls won't stop the kitchen fire happening, but they will potentially stop somebody losing their life or the house burning down. And at, once you get to that point, you can see, oops, whoop, what a terrible drawing. Do you remember Mr. Squiggle, like upside down, upside down? That is a very terrible looking bow tie, but a bow tie nonetheless. So that's the, that's the core concept underneath. So that might've been a slightly difficult example to follow, but I guess what I'm trying to get across to you guys there is that there's all these big sort of weighty techniques out there, but the reality is the way you apply them in the business can actually be really agile and tactical. And what I'm leading to hopefully what you're starting to see is that we've talked a bit about business continuity, this business impact analysis and this maximum allowable outage time. Even if you don't need or want or have a, have a reason to use those, I would say you can then go straight to a, a great technique like the bow tie analysis and you can effectively and quite concise, in quite a concise fashion, develop up a business, effectively a business continuity plan which incorporates those aspects that I've just spoken about that's relevant to your business using nothing more than a bow tie. I mean, look, ideally you wanna have a little bit more substance behind your planning, but at the moment when we're just all trying to respond back to that PPRR model, that respond space, I would say use one of these bow ties, use them to plan out the way that you're going to I guess, maintain your business if it's gonna be a business that can be maintained. And then we can start to get a little bit more excited about the, the recovery and um, back to the planning stage, which is where I think some of the more detailed and weightier topics that I've talked about might become more useful to you. But at the moment, we're just gonna focus on the bow tie. So let's do a, hopefully a more real world example based on predictably the COVID-19 um, state in relation to a business that might match to yours. So look, let's just say, back to that example again, we go to our middle point here, so our actual bow tie. And what I'm also going to add on to this, and I'm not trying to confuse you, is what we call the inherent or hazardous condition that's in play. So at the moment, COVID-19 is present in the community, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a fact. In fancy pants risk management speak, you might talk about this in terms of scope and context. We're not worrying about any of that sort of detailed stuff today. I just wanna put that up there so you can say, well, let's call it the inherent um, yeah, potential hazard or risk is the fact that COVID is around in our community, okay? So then you wanna draw a line and go, well, how the hell is that gonna affect my business? And it might be different for every business. So, you know, I'm not talking about everybody just being as broad terms, uh, broad in their terms as saying COVID-19 outbreak in my business. There might be a specific unwanted event that you're trying to prevent. And I'd encourage you to think at a, at a quite detailed and, you know, don't just jump to, jump to sort of conclusions on that based on what your, your instincts say. So I would say, you know, take a, a business that provides professional services to another business the really significant event that's gonna impact their business continuity might be the fact, as I said, that they can no longer effectively access their um, IT infrastructure, or there might be another issue, for example, where you've got real personnel, say, delivering real services in a home. The threat might be that your staff or your personnel are now unable to attend to their job in the normal way. They might no longer be able to um, deliver their services in a home-based environment if they deliver home-based services in the trade space or in the aged care or caregiving space. So you wanna get that event right. So let's say, um, just as an example, let's say um, COVID-19 outbreak in my workforce. And I'm going to assume that you know some of you have workforces, some of you are self-employed, some of you this may not be even relevant to. So the actual event we're trying to prevent or we're trying to respond to, or let's say the event that we really is going to have the most significant impact on our business continuity and our ability to deliver our core services is if you have a COVID-19 outbreak in your workforce. 
So we go, all right, well, what might happen as a result of that? And it's not, you know, it's the obvious one. So, you know, loss of life. I, I'm going to get a little bit more businessy here and say what could also happen. It could be loss of loss or suspension of major contracts. I mean, you know, that's ultimately going to be a loss of revenue for, your, for the business. Might be non-compliance with your regulator. So as in non-compliance related to whatever relative legislative environment you're operating in. Non-compliance with legislation or standards. You know, you might be a business that's certified to a particular or specific standard or standard might even result in, look, you know, the, I know the, if they're not already out there, the ambulance chases no doubt will be out in coming months if you've got a workforce that um, are, you know, potentially exposed to that. And so it might end up with, you know, litigation, um, you know, work injury damages claims, all the stuff that comes out of the potential downside of having employees or workers work for you. Litigation, um, work, injury, damages. And look, you know, the, the list could go on. We could end up with like, you know, 10 or, 10 or 12 there, but this is just, again, for illustrative purposes, okay? And so what could cause the COVID outbreak? So could it be, so we know that it's present in the community. How is it actually going to get into your workforce in a way where it's going to um, affect them? Or your, let's say your business. So poor hygiene, um, what I mean is poor personal hygiene. Um, I would say, uh, what do you call it? Lack of social distancing. We could, what I'm really saying there is, you know, not non-compliance with social distancing guidelines could be shared work surfaces. Could be meetings, and you can probably start to see where I'm going with this. And, and you probably, um, you know, because we're small businesses and entrepreneurs, we're all very agile and very smart and very quick to attune ourselves to this. Appreciate that many of you have probably already been through this process and you might be way ahead of me, but that's fine. I want to give you that opportunity to at least see our take on it anyway. Um, meetings might be. Um, traveling for work, as in, you know, you, you might have a workforce that's traveling in cars together. Um, you know, might be overseas travel, so you might have people or you might have their family members that have recently traveled overseas. So that's just, again, that's just a, a number of them. There's probably a heap more in there. So you go, all right, well, now we understand what we want to prevent, what it could result in. And what are the, the ways that it could happen? So if you remember back to my three C's in terms of controls, connection, causality, think of it as this fancy pantsy mind map. We go, all right, well, if you're a business, let's say you're a smaller legal practice and you might employ 10 people, 15 people, something like that. You run a real office. You're not remotely located. So you go poor personal hygiene. How do we prevent poor personal hygiene from resulting in a COVID-19 outbreak? We might actually then go to what I know everybody's talking about, you know, let's call it the A, A teams and B teams control. So the risk control there really is reducing the overall number of people in your workplace at any one time. Um, lack of social distancing, the way we prevent that might be, look, and these controls might also be linked as well, but this is just, again, just a thought exercise. Lack of social distancing might be splitting teams. As in you might remove all your non-essential teams or you might cut them in half and co-locate them other other areas. Shared work surfaces. You might go, all right, well, we're going to remove, and it, you probably can't see at this distance anyway, remove all shared cutlery. Uh, meetings. You go, well, you know, if we're all remote working, so it might be remote working, and there also might be another control here, that's virtual meetings. 
traveling in cars. You might redistribute work. There might, yeah, you might, um, you might need to renegotiate contracts. You, um, overseas travel, that's an easy one, you know. You might suspend overseas travel. And again, these are, these are things that I think are already out there happening now, but what I'm trying to bring you into the mindset of is that when you approach them with this systematic risk-based approach, you actually get a better result and a better, um, what we'll talk about shortly, a better defensibility behind the decisions you're making. And we'll, we'll move on to this directors and officers liability around WHS shortly. But so look, I'm going to leave it at that because then you'd see on the other side here, sorry, before I leave it at that, on the other side here, if you do have a workplace um, outbreak, then you might have an isolation process. You might also want to consider a deep cleaning, you know, like a, a rapid response cleaning. Uh, and then obviously you'd have things that you'd have, you know, your self-isolation all that sort of stuff. So hopefully you're starting to see this picture of again, as I said, the bow tie. And look, it's just again, it's a structured mind map style risk analysis. And me being, I'm a very visual learner. I love this sort of stuff. So as you can see, I'm really excited about it. I just think it's a great way to quickly and easily transfer quite technical knowledge across to a wide audience in a way that's easy to understand. So. Hopefully you got, my, got your head around this bow tie example. And as you've just seen there, even you guys as small business owners and entrepreneurs, we did that in five minutes. You could sit down with your team, it might only be four people, might be on a, a Zoom call and bang, bang out a bow tie. And I guarantee you, when you approach it with this systematic risk, um, risk management mindset, there'll be times where you just go, oh wow, we didn't think about that. So it's just about making sure that you've made informed decisions, you've minimized your assumptions and your bias, and you've actually got some defensibility behind them. So that is the basics of how you can then deploy one of these bow ties. Okay, so the reality is that whether we like it or not, we still have legal obligations to our businesses and ultimately to our staff if we employ staff in amidst all of this crisis. Probably one of the most significant sets of obligations that we have from a legislative, legislative perspective as business owners is that if you're in Australia and particularly in New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia, really any jurisdiction is related to work health and safety. So the way the legislation views COVID-19 is that if you employ people and those people come to a place of work for you, whether it be a off-site location, whether it be an office block, whether it be wherever they complete work for you, you owe, you owe a specific duty and an obligation to them to provide them with a safe place of work. There's a whole lot of emerging practice and no doubt in the years to come after this, uh, there'll be a whole lot of, let's say, case law potentially around where employers, us business owners, have failed to provide a, a safe place of work for our workers in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. And bad things happen, whether that be, you know, deaths as a result of COVID, whether that be psychological illnesses as a result of the stress and anxiousness and the whole bunch of, you know, psychosocial factors that have interacted and are interacting with this. So you go, all right, that, that's not to scare you. And that's certainly not to sort of, you know, fear monger. But what I'm saying is that the techniques I've just showed you, they are a great way to help try and create a defensible position for yourself and the people within your business around meeting your obligations. So I won't go into the Corporations Act requirements, but again, I think you know all of us in that space would probably have a, a good general understanding. They started around Section 180, I think. So have a look at those and just have a look at general duties of directors and officers, and then certainly have a look at the legislation around work health and safety relevant to your jurisdiction. What I'm saying is these techniques that we're taking you through, they're a great way to try and help you improve the defensibility of your position as a business in this current COVID-19 requirement. So, uh, sorry, COVID-19 drama, situation, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's really just all I wanted to cover on that, saying that the why should I care about this stuff? Because it can help cover your ass. It can help protect you as a director and an owner of a business. So do that because that will reduce the threat of you getting 
prosecuted or being responsible for you or someone within your business being injured or even losing their life. The recovery and rebuilding stage. Again, um, economics, finance, um, uh, Australian standard, international standard nerds like me, go and have a look at the standards and go and have a look at this PPR model about the recovery and rebuilding phase. But I think hopefully if you're already in that future focused mindset, you're thinking about when, when, when and how am I gonna go about the process of rebuilding and recovering my business or certainly resuming normal operations. And so I think a lot of the, uh, probably the predominant question a lot of us have in our minds is when should I start that process or when should I start planning for that process? My response to that question would be now or yesterday. I think you should already be planning for that recovery and I think you should be using these techniques that I've talked you through today to try and already get ahead of the curve on the rebuild and the recovery that will look ultimately is already on its way in relation to the COVID-19 crisis. Okay guys, just to wrap up, they're the five key areas that we've talked about that I've covered with you today. However, I can't emphasize enough, don't get lost in the technical mumbo jumbo around risk management. Risk management needs to be first and foremost a language of business decision making and the techniques I've talked you through, it's really predominantly about helping you build rigor and defensibility in the way that you and your organization makes business decisions. So supporting this presentation, I've got a couple of tools together for you. So we've got our imminent exposure scorecard, our business continuity checklist, and we've also got our bow tie analysis tip sheet. So I encourage you to share those freely and widely because we're all in this together. And from my perspective, I think it's community and connection that will get us safely through to the other side. So I hope you have a great week and please stay safe, healthy and productive. Thank you. For more expert talks, just visit dent.global forward slash reinvent because we believe that the decisions that you make now matter more than ever. We started Dent 10 years ago in the middle of the GFC in London and we shared the key person of influence methodology as a tool to be able to help businesses thrive despite the chaos. Today, it's a best-selling book and over 3,000 businesses use the methodology like an operating system for driving performance. And we've learned that regardless of economic conditions, that your primary focus as a founder should be showing up as the go-to brand, the key person of influence in your industry. More important than systems or social media, more important than Facebook videos or launching a website, the goal of showing up as the key person of influence in your industry should be the organizing force. It should be the primary objective that helps align all your other decision making. Because as your influence and reach expands, it becomes easier and cheaper to attract clients, team, media, even investors. When times are tough, it's the key people of influence that become even more valuable and even more in demand. And if you've been in business for a while, you're probably a lot closer than you think. So every week that this COVID-19 thing continues, I'm going to be hosting a weekly talk to better help business leaders like yourself recalibrate their focus so they can make the most of the times that we're in. If you're interested in jumping on a Zoom and saying hi with me, you can find the link to register for my sessions as well as all of the crisis response team sessions at dent.global forward slash reinvent. If you found this useful, let us know. My name's Glenn Carlson and please be brave. Have fun. Let's go make a dent in the universe.